There are three kinds of people in this world. Winners, losers, and pilots. There are three kinds of pilots. Those that fly airplanes, those that fly fighters, and fighter pilots. So, so of course, Bud Smith <laughs> turns to me and goes, you got fucking balls, kid. <laughs> I said, yeah. And that's when he told me, he said, there are three kinds of people in this world. Winners, losers, and pilots. You got what it takes to be one of those. And I went, thank you, okay? He's teaching me to fly. Charlie is a former instructor pilot at pilot training. The airplane gets to 1,000 feet, and he goes, your airplane, holy shit, there's an airplane out there. I got to join up and fly with him, et cetera. <clears throat> Week goes by. Charlie says to me, take the light on the end of the wing. This is how technical it is. This is how tense it is. Take the light on the end of the wing and put it in the chevron, the star with the circle around it and, and the, the bars coming out inside, which we call the chevron. Put it in there. Keep it there. You're not looking here. You're not looking there. You hear about these air crashes where four airplanes flying on the side of a mountain because the other three aren't, aren't looking out. They're looking at the other airplane. If the lead fucks up, guess what? Bye-bye. You bye-bye. So I'm sitting here, you know, and the sweat's pouring, et cetera, et cetera. I get it to the point where I'm pretty good at it. Then we go from two ship to four ship. Holy shit. Charlie, forget about the other airplanes. Put the light and forget about them. It's you and him. That's it. Boom. Now, when you say put the light, you're talking about the light that's on your wingtip, right? When you're looking at an airplane flying in the sky, how do you see it at night? With lights? The There's li a light on each wing. Right. That's the light I'm talking about. But you're... That light... Into it's the... lined up with the wing, with the with the chevron that's on the fuselage. Okay, so you line I it gotcha. up and keep it there. And that's that. And that gives you your distance and your spacing. Gives you distance, spacing, etc. Now sometimes you can actually fly out like this and stay on the same line, but you go like this and you get it right into the point where you're in here. Because when he goes like this, you got to stay there. And when he goes like this, you got to go. So we do an Immelman and we do a barrel roll. Okay. The only thing you don't do is aileron rolls, which are like this, okay? But, but the point is, is you're doing all this stuff. And the reason that you're doing this is, is that when you go to drop a bomb, you're dropping it at 30 degrees, at 360 knots. You're not dropping it at 29 and a half degrees. You're not dropping it at 31 degrees. You're not at 350 knots. You're not at 365 knots. You're at 30 degrees, 360 knots, because that's where the target, the pipper on the front seater, is pointing at where the bomb's going to go. And you're coming down the chute, and you drop it at, in, in combat, you drop it at 6,000 feet. Wow. You don't drop it at 5,500, you don't drop it at 5,000, because if you drop it lower, you go lower, and that's where the guns are, that's where the AAA is, and you fly right into your own death. Wow. So when you're in the back seat, and you're rolling in, and I'm going steep, he knows he's at 35, 30 degrees. You know, I go, one degree, steep, get it, boom. And the good ones, the great ones, are at 30 degrees, 360 knots, right where it's supposed to be, Six and I call feet, Pickle, yeah. I call Pickle, the bomb comes off and we pull out and we come home safe and sound. Wow. Wow, very so, technical. So, so we go back to where this training was. So sure enough, we're in four ship. I wind up three. That's fingertip formation, okay? One, two, three, four. I'm flying in three. That means there's a guy out here depending on me. We get the debrief, everybody's sitting there and the, and the comments start coming. Great job, Bernsey. Everybody else has got their hands up like this. I'm sitting there, oh, holy shit, you know. <laughs> and, a, and the front seater over there is going, I ain't giving this to the back seater. You know, none of the back seaters are getting to fly. I am because Charlie already knows that he can fly. He's an instructor pilot. I got two instructor pilots teaching me. Boom, 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 boom. Okay? I am so fucking, I'm sitting there Friday afternoon. Oh, man. And the chest is coming out and I'm feeling great. Da, 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 da. Briefing's over. Bud calls it off, we get up, we're getting up and leaving, and Charlie says, Joe, I'd like a word with you. Yes, sir. I sit back down. Bud's walking out the door. He looks at Charlie, he says, what's, it, what's going on? He goes, oh, this is just between Joe and I. And Bud looks at him and says, there's nothing between you and Joe. I'm your instructor pilot. And he sits down, and Charlie looks at me and says, you've already been told what a great job you did. The good ones keep the light in the star. The great ones put the light on a point of the star. 
And I oh, went man. from, <laughs> holy shit. And that's how they get you. They move the goalposts. From walking and chewing gum to being a fighter pilot. So when I, and then Bud, he's teaching me and so forth, and he says, the reason that we're doing this is the Air Force determined a long time ago that they didn't like having a passenger back there. The Navy doesn't have a stick in the back seat of the F-4. You're not a passenger. You're a crew member. If I fuck up, my wife and my kids are expecting you to bring me home. I went, okay. And I did that a few times. I did that a few times. We graduated, went to sea survival. We'd, and we had already gone to basic survival school, which is the most intense training you could ever imagine. It was up in Fairfield uh, Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington. I'm 74 years old. When I was there, I was 24. That's been 50 years, and I'm still Still reacting to the cold. I hate it. It was five degrees below zero for two and a half weeks. We froze our fucking asses off out there. But I'll tell you one thing. I turned to one of my friends in, in POW camp, and I looked at him and I said, they drugged us. We're not in America. That son of a bitch is not an American. He has a fucking Russian uniform on. He talks with a Russian accent. He says, so? I said, I'm going to kill him. And the guy looks at me. I, said, I literally, I said, if he touches me, I'm gonna kill him. I don't know where I'm gonna go from there, but I'm gonna kill him. This fucking guy picks me up. I'm sitting in the stool. He goes to pick me up. It's a one-legged stool, so the feet are up above you here like this and so forth. We're in solitary confinement. We have to go through three of these interrogations. One's intellectual, one's psychological, one's physical. He leeches down and picks me up. He's got me by, right here by one hand. He's about six foot six, picks me up. Next thing I realize is my feet are not on the floor, Whoa. and he's bouncing me off the wall with one hand and throws me in the corner. This is Picks POW me, school. POW. Throws, this is the shit you go through before you get to walk out and have one of the finest gentlemen I've ever met in my entire life, major at that time, Big John Davis, climb into the airplane, I sit in the airplane, we're getting ready to go on my first combat ride. And he says, okay, we're ready to go. And I'm sitting there going, I, 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 what? okay, yeah, I'm ready. He goes, no, no, no. Call the command post, get us clearance, and we're ready. And I, I'd never talked on the freaking radio. I hit the microphone. I've been doing this for eight months. And I hit the microphone, and I go, um, um, uh, he says, undo it, click. He says, okay, what's our call sign? What's their call sign? What's our call sign? Da, da, da. Um, uh, Bisson Control, uh, this is um, uh, a gunfighter uh, 2 1. Uh, we're a flight of two. Uh, and you can hear everybody at the command post laughing their asses <laughs> off at the FNG. Okay, now, I think everybody understands what the F stands for. New guy. Okay, so I'm obviously the FNG. We go out in our squadron, the 390th Attack Fighter Squadron in Vietnam at Da Nang Air Base. The back seaters did all the talking. The front seaters flew the airplane and dropped the bombs. The back seaters did all the navigation, all the radar, and all the talking. That's the way it was split up, okay? So, I mean, like the, and it's like, what the fuck are they talking about, okay? So we get to Vietnam. And now Woody Bergeron got shot down. Now, Bernsey, just, just for context, you're in Da Nang at this point in time, Okay, correct? so Charlie, Jack Holmquist, Swede, and myself get our orders out of our class. We're going to Da Nang. Got it. I don't want to ruin the punchline, but I will. I sat in the center seat on the bird going over. Charlie sat on the aisle. Swede had the window. I was the junior officer, so I got the middle seat. 362 days later, I am happy to tell you that I got on that air flat freedom bird, as we called it, and I sat in the middle seat. And Charlie sat on the aisle, and Swede was on the way. On the way All down. your guys made the it. Three of us went together and came home together. That's remarkable. Charlie and I thought we were going to get to fly together because we didn't realize we were both FNGs when we got there. We flew one time. My very last 215th mission was with the great Charles Rasmussen. 
215, 215 missions. missions. Okay. Wow. 525 hours of flight time. Of flight of combat time. Oh my Officially goodness. on my two, DD-214. I am not sure. There'll be people that'll argue, but I think that's the most it's in an F-4 be the Phantom most in one year. In an F-4 Phantom. In, an, in one year. In one year. I was a stormy fast fact for eight months. Three and a half hour mission. We'll get into that. Anyway, wow. we're there two weeks. We're learning of where the targets are. And there is one area on the border between North Vietnam and Laos called Mu Gia Pass. And one of the guys in my flight, in my, in my class, got shot down. Mm. We're in Vietnam for two weeks. We're flying for two weeks in Vietnam. This is one of my proudest moments. It's also one of the moments I'm pissed off about because the official report, which I did not know existed up until about three months ago, and one of the, other, one of the reasons why I'm doing this is because the official report says that Woody Bergeron wound up being rescued after at the longest tenure on the ground accurate. 51 and a half hours. Wow. Front seater got killed on the second day. He heard the gunshots. Gentleman's name, Captain Fitzgerald. I can't remember what his first name was. His granddaughter just graduated, and this is why it came up on Facebook. He was killed by the North Vietnamese. He was killed the North on the ground by, the, by the North Vietnamese. Mugia was a pass. The, the carts were about uh, 1,500 feet high, so it was that deep. It wasn't as big as the Grand Canyon, but it was freaking wide. And I mean, they had a river running through it, the river Ho Chi Minh, one of the trails that ran down to Chapon and then down into South Vietnam. The, the goods came out of Hanoi, went through this pass, down the river, down the, down the, the road that ran along the river. And we weren't allowed the rules of engagement, ass kisses, weren't allowed to fucking bomb inside of North Vietnam. They'd sit on the border of North Vietnam and, and wait for, de for nighttime, and then they'd cross at nighttime, and we try to catch up to them and catch them with all this fancy stuff and so forth. But we could see them sitting there, but we couldn't do anything about it. McNamara and Johnson and And that and all frustrated everybody. Oh, shit, yeah. You know, if people want to argue about the Vietnam War, the Vietnam War could have been over in 30 fucking days. Mm-hmm. All we had to do was bomb the living shit out of them. Every time we got close, they stopped the bombing. And the North Vietnamese admitted that. They admitted that, that one of the bombing campaigns, they were within 48 hours of capitulating, of stopping, and we stopped. It's against the rules of engagement to drop napalm anywhere except, North, except South Vietnam. It's against the rules of engagement, okay? There's a two-star general that did a report on this search and recovery. And they claim that Woody Bergeron was saved by a helicopter after they laid down a smoke screen to, to stop the North Vietnamese from seeing where he is. Why would they make that claim? It was a smoke screen. Did they find him? Yeah. Did they get him out? Yes. And because when we called up Hillswell Control, they diverted us to the search and recovery effort. Wow. Called up the FAC, nail five, uh, three five, this is gunfighter two one, flight of two. And he goes, hey, two one, uh, welcome to the party. I said, Roger, we have wall to wall napalm on board. What the fuck are you doing here? Damned if I fucking know. <laughs> you know, I'm not supposed to say fuck on the radio. So yes, my actual call sign was damned if I know, but we're here. He says, adjust your bingo. Bingo is the fuel you need to get home, okay? Adjust your bingo so you can, go, so you can dispense you with your ordinance. Let me know when you're leaving. Stay out of the way. Charlie says, all right, let's get the hell up. We go up to 25,000 feet. We're boring holes in the sky. Hey, Bravo. Now, when you're down on the ground, Alpha is the front seater. Bravo is the back seater. You don't use their call signs anymore. It's Alpha and Bravo, okay? You're Bravo. <clears throat> so he, Woody's Bravo. Alpha's dead. He's, and he said, he says, I don't, I think they killed him. I heard, I heard five gunshots and then I heard a bunch of heavy duty gunfire. So he had shot his five bullets out of his 38 caliber that we carried, or five or six bullets. And that's all everybody carried, for the most part, except me, after this. Anyway, they're coming to get me. 
3.5 says, I don't have any airplanes. I can't stop them. I can't stop them. They're coming to get me. Shit. Moon, Hillsborough, you got anything inbound? Nothing. No, everybody's dispensed and gone home. Okay. Don't know what... Oh, shit. Nail 3.5. This is gunfighter. I'm still sitting here at 25,000 feet. He goes, oh, shit. He says, I ain't asking anybody to commit suicide. Woody can hear this. He's on the radio. He goes, I recognize the voice because we had flown together for wow. nine fucking months. Woody's on the ground. He's, He's in the, the ground. jungle. He's about I, and to he get says killed. To me, he, says, he says, I ain't asking. No way. No way. You got a wife. You got a kid. I said, oh my God. I don't give a fuck. Whoa. I said it. I don't give a fuck. Charlie says, what do you got in mind? I said, there's two ways to get to 1,500 feet. Napalm has to be dropped at 1,500 feet to give it time to arm. Okay, and straight and level, just so you be accurate, you gotta be like this mm -hmm. in a 15 degree dive. Right. 1500, 15 degrees, straight. Give the living shit shot out of you that way, especially in this, they, they like, were watching there you, had right? There to be 400, 500, maybe a thousand guns. They were watching everybody, this search and rescue going down, right? Yeah, shit, the, yeah, the, they're shooting yeah, at every airplane. Yeah. We lost seven people, they, they lost a helicopter. Oh my they God. lost two other airplanes trying to get this guy out. They weren't going, you know. <clears throat> so Charlie says, what you got in mind? I said, there's two ways to get to 1,500 feet. So Burns, you're at 200 feet. You've got your fellow fighters on your wings and you've got a pilot down in the ground. He's going to get finished off by the yeah. BC. It's a matter of time. Yeah. And, and one of the things you have to understand is, is they weren't taking anybody and capturing them and keeping them. They were dead men. It was a men. long way to, not only were they dead men, if, if they didn't do what Fitzgerald did, which was get in a gunfight and die, I mean, if you get captured, they're going to cut you in pieces. They're going to torture you. They had, we had pictures of, of uh, American fighter pilots spread on their quartered, literally. There was a leg here and a leg here on their parachutes. They cut the parachutes in fourths, and you could see it from 10,000 feet. And there was a leg here, a leg here, and an, uh, a oh, half the torso here and half the torso there. This is the shit we're dealing with. Oh, For man. all you namby-pambies that think this is, war's hot hell, war's ugly, okay? So we're coming across the deck, and I call, I said, get him to the water, boom. We come in, we pop, we get to 1,500 feet, and, and Rube says, pickling on you. The fucking bombs come up. 28 cans of napalm. We lit that whole freaking valley up. Mm. Probably burned about 5,000 of the sons of bitches. Now I'm getting emotional about this. We break off left, right, and head back to v v Da Nang. Boom, boom, boom. Not a fucking word. There's no medal on that. There's no commendation on that. They don't even admit that we were there. The formal report, which I read three months ago, says a smoke screen, and that's how they got him out. And it's signed by a two-star general. Bullshit. Oh, we talked to so-and-so. Oh, we talked to so-and-so. Oh, we talked to so, -so. They didn't talk to Charlie. They didn't talk to Bernsey, because they'd have gotten an earful about it. Bernsey, if you didn't talk... But you know what? Woody Bergeron, when he landed at Nakam Phanam over in Thailand, picked up the phone and called Hanoi, and he goes, gets out of the phone, and he goes, he says, I'll kiss your ass on the city hall steps. And I'll wait around for a crowd and kiss the other cheek. I said, you got it, buddy. He said, thank you. I don't know what to say. Boom.